Suppose you create a large number of atoms. Suppose you make plutonium, and you have this plutonium here, and you wait. And after about uh, 24,000 years, half of the plutonium would have exploded. And you have this half left. So is it now the old man? Is it something with not much life left? So you make some new plutonium, and you compare it to the old plutonium. And they behave identically. This one isn't aged. In another 24,000 years, half of it will decay, half of this will decay. And you take the part that's left, one quarter of the original. And it behaves like brand new plutonium. This stuff doesn't age. So what is going on here? The fact is what's going on here is so mysterious that we just think of it as a new law of physics. It's not something you explain in terms of other things. There's no mechanism inside that's click, tick, 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 ticking. Suppose you create a large number of atoms. Suppose you make plutonium, and you have this plutonium here, and you wait. And after about uh, 24,000 years, half of the plutonium would have exploded. And you have this half left. So is it? Good evening, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I am your host, Sandy Shellis, and this is my guest, Paul Mobley. Welcome, Paul. I am thrilled to have you after all of this time. We I have know. been, yes, we have been Thank writing you for having back me. and forth. Yeah. Well, you've got something we need and to learn. We had we had Carl Paul on who from the um, eco eco what is it they call themselves? Um, I think the, it's something with Seattle. Isn't it? Yeah, well, that his name is Seattle, but he is the um, eco, all of a sudden a dry, I, I had a brain fart. The you know <laughs> the eco the, the nuclear people that think right. nuclear power will save you know the planet. And uh, eco modernist, thank you, Nadia. Well, and uh, but tonight you are here to give us a, a show, a slideshow. I've got everything ready, and uh, so take it away, Paul. And then well, I'll say hi um, to everybody. I've been uh, researching all this for quite a few few years now. Um, like I said, I was a civil engineer in the uh, Air Force, uh, operating engineer in the private se sector. And um, after Fukushima happened, um, I pretty much dug in real deep and tried to get some of this information known and, and try to at least spread it around and get people this knowledge, you know. So um, I thought we would start with a little bit of the basics. Give us the basics. So, Sure. So if we want to start with number one, we can um, go with the typical atom, what an atom looks like. All right, guys, we have a slideshow coming. All righty. So you got your, your protons and neutrons in the middle there with the nucleus. And then you have your electron. This is kind of a poor representation as, as it doesn't really orbit around the nucleus. It's more of a, like a, a cloud of probability. So this is basically our first understanding of quantum mechanics is this probability. And um, so if, if we can understand the basic um, structure of an atom and we try to understand what radiation does to atoms is basically it either attracts or repels a, an electron away from its orbital, or it causes some sort of scattering effect, um, which is what like gamma does through uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, we can probably move on to the next one there. Um, All right, here we go. The difference, the difference between radioactivity and radiation. Um, radioactivity is the parent, the parent isotope or nucleide, um, and then what it decays into is the actual radiation. That's your alpha, your beta, your gamma, x-ray, all that. Um, 
it, it's important that we differentiate between these two because there is a difference. And a lot of people pretty much take these as being the same and they just aren't. So that's very important to know. Uh, when trying to read all this stuff um, on what they mean, you have to know this terminology. Otherwise, you could get it wrong. You know? um, so alpha is basically the nucleus that comes out, and it's it's ex exactly like a uh, helium nucleus without the electrons, um, two protons, two neutrons. Okay, the beta is an electron. That's the electron that comes that is emitted out, and then gamma is your um, electromagnetic waves. It's a ray. It's just pure energy. Alpha and beta, beta are actual particles. They're something. It's not just pure energy. Okay. Uh, we could probably move on to the next one from here. <coughs> okay. So what the radiation does is it, it it takes the, the electron from the orbital, okay? And this is this represents the way that alpha does it. Um, alpha, since it is po uh, positively charged, it will attract an electron from its orbital, and that's the damage that it does. That's what radiation damage does, Ooh. is it takes electrons and it causes things to be become unbalanced, unstable, and that's where the damage comes from. Wow. So wow. Um, beta, beta is negatively charged. It's an it's an electron, so it will it will repel it. It will push it out of its orbital, where alpha attracts it out of its orbital, and that's that's what ionizing means. Is it it causes it to be an ion, an unbalanced. It doesn't have the same amount of protons as elect electrons. Okay. At that point. All right. We're okay. getting a so lesson we, for sure. Okay. So when we talk about gamma, we can probably move on to the next slide. Um, it's a bit different. Okay. Um, this, uh, this is colliding radiation. This happens through kinetic energy from it actually hitting the electron. And this is mainly through Compton scattering. There's Rayleigh scattering. There's the photoelectric effect. And these are all just ways that gamma can affect an electron of an atom. And you can see secondary ionization can occur. Um, as, it, as it hits one electron in one atom, it can bounce off and hit, strike another electron in another, in another atom. So that's how, that's how gamma radiation works. It's all affecting the electrons of the atoms. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, what is the next slide? Is it the, the, the penetration, I think? Yeah, so alpha can be blocked by a sheet of paper because it's, it's the bigger particle. Uh, beta uh, can, can kind of go through your skin, and it could be kind of blocked by a thin metal. Uh, gamma pretty much goes through most things, even lead it can go through. And then neutrons just go through everything. Um, the difference here is that the energy is distributed along however however long path it is. So they say that gamma can travel up to ten feet in the air. Mm -hmm. So it's going to deposit all of its energy through that ten feet. Okay. Now alpha. It, it only travels millimeters in the air, but it deposits its energy within those millimeters. So alpha is blocked by clothes or even the it's, skin? It's blocked by paper, by a piece of paper. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Even by a piece of paper. Hmm. Right. They just don't, it doesn't travel as far. Thank you. Because it's, it's bigger. It's bigger. Uh, the, the beta will travel a little further and it'll penetrate into the skin a little further than alpha will. Thank you. And then Great. gamma will just penetrate right on through. All right. Yeah. We'll go right. back. So um, 
the, a lot of this has to deal with like shielding, uh, attenuation, gamma attenuation, trying to shield from certain things. So they, they, they think about this when they're building these reactors, when they're building, um, you know, the medical field, when, when they're doing stuff in there that, to to do the x-ray or, mm -hmm. or proton therapy or whatever have you, Nuclear you know, they medicine. have, they have, they have to think about the shielding and what it takes to, to keep people safe. Oh, absolutely. I, I know I've had them. <laughs> I've had these def MRIs and things, right? They have the, the radiation in them. Okay. Right, right, right. right. So, um, well, let's see here. What do we got? I, I do have some notes. <laughs> Good. What's that's your... fine. Listen, um, it's your show because you're. What is you're the next us. slide? The what? next slide was the. Okay, wait. This it was the characteristics. Okay, the energies, right? Yes. The energies. Okay, so your. Let's think about this. Your your typical calorie. Okay, your calorie that's burned that All has right. the the energy of like four point two joules. Okay, they go off this joule measurement. It's either joules or ergs or it's something else, oh, but joules. it's mainly off of joules. Yes, joules. Um, so then uh, an electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, which is basically 0 0.19 zeros, then 1602. Okay, that amount of energy is in one electron volt. Okay. Can I have a question really quick? Okay. okay. Jules, Jules. Jules. Jim, ba uh, Jim, our oceanographer, okay. Massa, is always talking about how the ocean heat is measured in zettajoules. Okay, so zettajoules. That would. That's right. a similar, it was a similar measurement, but right, it's right, one right. you're talking about. I'm not about, sure what, what it would represent, but yeah. you're talking probably millions or millionths or. Right, but you if know, one trillions is ocean, or whatever it is. if one is ocean heat and one is radiation based, it's got to have. It would still be. It's still energy. That's that's energy. the way that they. It's it's just pure energy. Right. Yeah, how they Thank they measure you. the energy. Sure. So I actually sure. have it's a very little similar, bit of the right? brain cells left. All right, I'm happy, guys. <laughs> I have some brain cells left. This is good. Mm -hmm. All right, so <laughs> listen, we can't do anything without humor. No, of course. <laughs> okay. All right. So here okay, we so, go. Okay. So, so um, most uh, radioactivity you're going to be in the MeV range, the million electron volt range. Uh, you'll have some interactions that are a few hundred thousand, and you'll have some interactions in the case of like fusion will be two hundred million electron volts. So, so that's just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, the typical calories, 4.2 joules. Well, then you're talking MEV, millions of electron volts, that those zeros, those 19 zeros start to come back towards the point. You know what I'm saying? saying? Yes. yes, I'm getting there. So, right. So that's your, your typical um, energy levels, um, cobalt 60, co uh, carbon 14. You hear a lot about carbon-14. They use that in dating. Um, I don't quite agree with it. I don't think it's as accurate as people think it is. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the reasons I've heard is, is carbon-13 plays a role in having a slight effect to it. And um, I just don't think it's that accurate as, as people think. Okay. Um, so radium, um, there's... there's um, what is it? The Becquerel and the Curie. Um, it's based off of radium two two six, and the Curie is what is it? Thirty, I think it's thirty seven billion disintegrations per second. Wow. Thirty seven. Let me say that again. One Curie is thirty seven billion disintegrations in a second. Now, Dis do you think they they can count to thirty seven billion in a second? Give me the go over disintegrations in a second. So, so disintegrations will be like the decay, like when when it um, when you have that daughter element, yes. that radionuclide, right. and then it then it 
decays and it explodes like we've seen the half-life that right. Richard Muller explained right. in the beginning where it explodes and it just vanishes, right? Um, that's your decay. And decay so is just all about those that amount of disintegrations mm -hmm. that that many explosions t to them vanishing per second. This is uh, so that, big because so I, the decay is right, what's thirty-seven. Dangerous. It's strange that it's thirty-seven. It seems strange to me that they could count the thirty-seven billion <laughs> disintegrations in a second. Well, obviously they can't. So it has to be obviously. done through math. It has to be done through calculations well, on a sheet of paper. Of course. Well, in a computer program. <laughs> well, back then when they were doing it, this Ooh, was long ago. Madame right. Curie, Madame Curie, yes. she did all this work back long, long ago in the early 1900s. You're right. So they didn't have computers back no, then. No, and they, they, and they took Purely on a their, sheet of paper. With yeah. their, their rulers and they made their graphs. And yes, you are right. My so, gosh, yeah, how very right. interesting. Slide yeah, so rules, that's... Channel Warhorse says. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 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 Wow. Right. So, so yeah, that's, that's there's a lot of things that's, that's based off of mathematical calculations i mean you can only go so far with trying to not only try to understand this but explain it I mean, like, <laughs> well you're doing a good job so okay um we could probably move on to the next one i don't think we got anything to work on there um so half lives okay what he didn't what we didn't hear richard moeller say is he he actually says this is that each single radionuclide has the same exact 50-50 chance per second to decay. Okay, that's, that's also part of the half-life that he explained. Um, so the, the time frames that they give for these half-lives, like he said, plutonium has a 24,000-year half-life. Mm, that has to deal with a group of the same radionuclides in a mass, and half of that mass will decay within that time frame. So there again, 24,000 years. Nobody's been around for 24,000 years waiting for a mass of plutonium to see if half of that decays. They haven't? So this is, right. So really? this is all done on a sheet of paper. Again, this is all done purely through math, through calculations, trigonometry, calculus, all that, and it's based on these, on this decay ch decay um, constant. Okay, they they believe that these things decay at a constant rate, which isn't quite true because um, there's evidence. Uh, I think it's uh, some sort of Qui Gon master in China, and he did some peer review studies where he was able to change the actual decay constant, the decay rate of of uh, uh, I'm not sure what it, what he did it on, but it was a group. Uh, it was a mass that he changed the rate. So I I don't think that it, it that it can be a constant. Um, I think it's it's um, it can be different. It can be just changed. It can be manipulated. I know for a fact that it can change through nuclear reactions with other things. So. Well, all this you have to take with a grain of salt, <laughs> honestly. With uh, I'm trying to explain it the way they would explain it to you. Okay. okay. So, um, so half life. I mean, that's a lot of people think that it's safer once it reaches its half life, and that just isn't true. It's just as he explained, it has the same exact characteristics. That's right. From old to new, it, they can't measure any kind of difference to it. Whether there is, and there, they just have no way of measuring it, we don't know. But from any, all their measurements, both look the same, new versus old. Now, these things can go through several half-lives. It doesn't just go through its half-life and it's done. It'll half, just like this graph is showing. It'll mm -hmm. go half within that yeah. time frame, yes. and then half of a half, and then half of a half, and on down till it gets down to one. And then once it gets down to that one, it still has a 50% chance to go through a whole another half-life before it disintegrates, before it decays away. So in layman's term, it never goes away. It does, but it, I mean, it, in it's years. half and half and half and half and half yeah. and half. Eventually, it'll get down to where it does decay away, yeah. but it takes time. It takes time for that. 
want to take a quick question? Sure. Is there a chain of daughter elements? I mean, are there granddaughter elements or do they keep disintegrating into different elements? Yes, it's called decay chains. They call them decay chains. You have a, a different decay chain for whatever parent you start with. So U-235 has a different decay chain than U-238. Okay. Plutonium right. has a different decay chain. Thorium has a different decay chain and they all decay down into their daughter elements. I, okay. I don't I, have I, them memorized. I'm sorry, but it's they're, they the chains are quite long. Okay. And they go through releasing pure energy to releasing, you know, alpha particles and those turn into other things. Yes. Right. And Reverend says, uh, not a mathematical constant by the slope of the deceleration of the mass observed is constant. Well, sure. But I mean, it's, it's, um, it can be manipulated. It, it can't be just a, a, a constant. It cannot be. It's been, it's been shown, it's been peer reviewed to be able to be manipulated. Okay. Through the math, may, it may say that. But it, but we're seeing more and more that real life doesn't is it right. translated from paper and, and what's on a screen. Yes, we see this over and over and over again. Thanks. He happens to be a friend of mine, so I gave yeah. him a little. I gave him a, and I know him in sure. person, so I gave him a little preferential uh, comment sure. up there. All right. Sure, so I I, are... I actually agree with him. The math will work out that way, but like I said, the it doesn't it doesn't translate to real life okay well let's move on because we are sure getting a lesson and i think that there are a lot of us that might have to watch this <laughs> twice <laughs> and i'm running it so of course you know i'm trying hard here right. all right. right let's see and thank you for yeah. for letting me interject with some uh sure um, anytime uh, Whatever questions, if I well, don't know it, I'll tell you I don't know it. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. Is... I haven't conducted these studies or tests. You know what I mean? I've, I've just done a lot of reading, and I know this information. Yeah, and the show is interactive, which is the best. You know, yeah, this is why right. everybody comes. Because comes. we are yeah, interactive. They gotta be able to, it's great. They gotta All be right, able to so ask we questions. were just here. And sure. Yeah, we can probably move on. That's All that's right. half life, though. So it does not make it safe. Is this the one that I had? This is the right order on this one, right? Sure. I mean, I I don't or know if it I is or not, it but we'll just we'll just talk about it. Come um, on, I this, worked so hard at making sure. You're doing I... <laughs> great. You're doing great. It doesn't matter which order it's in. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to this then. <laughs> okay. Because this was interesting. Okay. What you're seeing is um, an excerpt from a, an article that I found. Um, Back in 1945, they did they conducted what's known as the Trinity test. Um, you may have heard of it. Um, everybody else may have heard of it, but um, some people don't know that we found out about this test through the Kodak Picture Company. Okay. Really. And what happened was their film runs in the Midwest states, and I, I believe even in the eastern. Um, on the eastern side of the country, they, they actually got damaged. It damaged the film. Um, the yeah. gamma that comes in, this is actually used to try to find radionuclides in a sample. Like okay. say you have like an air filter. Well, you can place um, film over it, and if it creates a spot in the film, then you know a rough guesstimate where that radionuclide is in that sample. So it kind of brings your search down a little bit easier. So they found that it had damaged massive amounts of these film runs. People were buying it and they were taking pictures. They go to developed and it was ruined, right? So come to find out that this Trinity test had damaged all this film. Really? So the Kodak company was actually going to sue the U.S. government, but they came to <laughs> okay. they came to a, a, an understanding, so to say, and uh, the government promised to tell Kodak on any future possible explosions. That way they could shut down the lines and allow the radiation to pass and then start back up once the radiation is passed. Now you have to ask yourself, why didn't the American people get that same warning? 
Uh-huh. If it if it damaged that film, what kind yeah. of damage did it do to yeah, our grandparents true. and my our parents to their lungs? They were breathing in these particles. Oh, and I was listening to some videos that were, you know, just to learn about things that had happened and it was chilling. The one the book um I think it was obsolete optics. You sent it was uh, the gal that wrote the book about all the tests that they did on people back in the forties without them knowing, uh, right. uh, with nuclear elements and giving yeah, them the plutonium the, injections. Oh, yeah. it was hideous. I have to post. There was that pregnant first. women. There was um, mentally handicapped people. There was tons of people that didn't even know it was occurring. They didn't even know, and that it was really. I listened to that today, and 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 Rod, you know, it happened right here at University of Rochester. I live in mm-hmm. Western New York. It was quite scary to read yeah. it. But of course, you know, a lot has changed. But the the point was it was still it was still just it wasn't right. It wasn't ethical. No. No. I All mean right. it's one thing to do it with people knowing, but to not tell them about it. That's it's, it's yeah. mind boggling. And so, Kodak I mean, again is in we Rochester. Would've, we would have never known if Kodak didn't come forward with the the issue of the the film, wow, the government hairy. would have just kept it quiet. That's hairy. Absolutely, they would have. Yeah. Wow. I mean, when you think about all the you know experiments they did on the the um, on the military people, I mean Kevin Blanche, uh, he's worked a lot on Fukushima. His father was in there, and and he was irradiated. They, wow. he was, he was a special forces Marine and they yes. raided him. I've heard yeah. Kevin's story. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to try to bring Kevin on as a guest. Too. Yeah. He would be a good guest on your yeah. show for sure. Yeah. He's done I a think lot. So yeah. I think so. Uh, all right. Let's see the next one. Let's move on. We did. Nope. We didn't go there yet. We were just here at this one. So yeah. let's move on to the cyclotron. The, the cyclotron. Okay. So this is how. We all know the periodic table, right? Well, it was it was made um, initially back in the 1800s by the chemists, okay? But then radioactivity came along, and the physicists from all the national laboratories, uh, mainly out at Berkeley, uh, then you got the Fermi Labs. They also did some work in this. But uh, Lawrence, um, Ernest Lawrence, He is the maker of the cyclotron. And um, and basically, all it comes down to is is mass and charge. They're basically trying to figure out how the frequency changes with each different element. And that's basically how they figured out how the mass and the charge uh, makes the atom. It, it makes up these oh. the, the radioactivity. They they figured out how to kind of separate things um, through this. Yes. Yes, this from was, that. This is this is it. This right, is like the, this the is you've heard of CERN, all. right? You've yep. heard of CERN, right? Yes, That's yes, the particle yes, accelerator. It's yes. the same concept, but it does it in a, a smaller area. It does wow. it in a circle, back and forth, back and forth, back yeah. and forth. So okay. the swirl, I mean, it's kind of correct, but it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily swirl like that. It, it a lot of times it'll keep the same track, and then as it goes over that gap in the middle, it it it, um, it picks up energy and accelerates it, and then they switch switch the charge of the hemispheres, and it attracts it back over to the other side, and that's and they keep on doing that, switching it back and forth, and then that's how they differentiate between everything oh, because of that that. that frequency of the swirling back and forth wow i've got a very important question i have to ask it scott says is there radiation in my beer (laughs) i'm sorry probably (laughs) probably scott there's radiation in everything and there's there's natural uh, radiation there's radiation from the sun yes there's there's radiation that's actually true yes absolutely of course the problem is is that The difference is between natural and what happens in our reactors. It's it's it doesn't de- it doesn't have that same decay chain. It doesn't de- it doesn't chain out like it like it does in our reactors. And that all has to do with um, which we'll talk about that when we talk about Oclo, 
Okay. All right. Well, I have one more thing I have to bring in because this is Bim Jim. I'm a materials engineer and I did some work for the nuclear power industry. I learned so much. I would shut down all of it. ASAP. All so right. Knows. People that, that work with this stuff, they know it. They know the things we're about to talk about, but they won't because of their own bias, because their money, because uh, yeah, their house, their their family, you know, which you can kind of understand to a point, sure. but sure. they all know this information and they know these reactors uh, are not good for this planet. It's scary. Okay. Yes. The next one. Let's go on okay. to Oh, Oklo. this is Oklo. Yeah, is we, your... well, we finished okay. with this one, so we're yep. going to go to Oklo. Okay, so this is your your natural nuclear reactor that everybody talks about is the, the Oklo reactor in Africa. Okay, now the fuel that they use in a reactor is U-235. That's the fissionable fuel. Okay, that's that's where you're going to get fission to occur. Okay. U-238 is not fissionable. It will fission when it's hit with fast neutrons, but it actually captures neutrons. It has a very, it has a, a large neutron cross section. So it will actually capture the neutrons from the U-235 that is released. Now, naturally the ratio of U-235 versus U-238 is 0.07% of U-235 and over 99% U-238. So you'd have to imagine in the ground, this U-238 is primarily surrounded completely by U-238, which will capture those neutrons and not allow those that chain reaction to occur and that same decay chain to occur. Now, speaking of the periodic table, everything after uranium on the periodic table is called oh, a trans it. it's called a transuranium element or a transuranic, okay? All right. These are all synthetic elements. They do not occur in any measurable quantity in nature. So you're not going to yeah, find maybe. the same stuff at Oklo as you're going to get out of our reactors, plain and simple. All right. The natural nuclear fission reactors. Right. Hmm. So there is a difference. You can't say they're the, they're the same idea, same concept because of the percentages involved. All right. Uh, a reactor has three to five percent ratio, and that's how they're able. You have to have that much. You can probably go down to one percent with like a fast breeder reactor, mm -hmm. but you need you need more than what naturally occurs for to get the reaction out of it. Okay. Hmm. Guys, so, all doing okay out there? I mean, the the uh, to to bring it into perspective, have you ever heard of control rods? Yes. For a reactor, okay, yes. they insert the control rods, right? Yeah. It's usually made out of like a boron or something like that. Yes. Well, yes. It's the same yes. thing. It's it's mm -hmm. capturing the neutrons instead of allowing it to to hit everything else and make that chain reaction, so it slows down. It captures the neutrons. And that's basically what the U-238 is doing in nature. It's, it's capturing those neutrons coming from the U-235. Mm, mm, mm. All right. Let's go on to uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Okay. Chernobyl is a, a very hot topic. and has been for decades. Um, you wait, I have to stop. Everybody not everybody wants to know where you're sitting. I've had an outhouse, <laughs> a fish shack. Nope. I mean, nope. you know, poop, 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 no, it's poop. just a, it's a small storage unit. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah, he he he, uh, he got um, you know, he's out with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, this is so, what I have available, so 
to it's be okay. so, so it was quiet, you know. So and it's working I'm, really well. I like it actually. I can see right. you and I hear you great. There's no echo. It's actually pretty good. So all awesome. right. So everybody happy now that you know where he's sitting? <laughs> yes, it's a storage unit, guys. Sorry. <laughs> it's not an outhouse for sure. <laughs> Why I've sat in mine <laughs> and done shows. All right. Wait, anyway. I think I'm getting a bite. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go let's go we've done that we're at, we're back to okay talk about okay chernobyl. chernobyl okay um chernobyl was uh it was one hydrogen gas explosion um it was in a rbmk nuclear reactor which has no containment vessel okay these reactors aren't built with a containment vessel okay um what was released was um, xenon, uh, iodine, cesium, um, probably, I think they said, at least 5% of the remaining material. Um, Pripyat wasn't, um, hmm. it wasn't evacuated until 36 hours later. Um, so a lot of people were exposed. Yeah, I think we all saw the movie. Right, right. Yeah. Um, interesting thing, though, um, the World Health Organization, it didn't show up until five years after Chernobyl occurred. Um, what you see before you, what you had up there on screen, um, is the 2001 uh, Kiev Symposium on Chernobyl. Um, if you watch this, you, you will literally see the corruption on screen and if well, you can't then you're completely blind we will um, and we'll put the the links up and i remember yeah, absolutely this. it's a must watch i okay, followed got... this i was scared to death when it happened are you kidding i yeah. mean it was it was terrifying right, to everybody right. all over the world right and they say everybody born after chernobyl has a piece inside of them whether oh that's true God. who knows right. you know what i mean right but um the thing there was things that happened um, that at Chernobyl that most people don't know. There was a man named uh, Lex. Uh, what was his name? Uh, I think I got his name somewhere. Uh, Yuri Bandachevsky. Okay. Yuri Bandachevsky. Um, mm -hmm. He was a uh, some sort of scientist, some sort of biologist, or something in Belarus, and he did a bunch of studies right after it occurred. And all the way up until the World Health Organization showed up, they ended up. Uh, he he showed how uh, the people of Belarus was absolutely contaminated, and he showed it that they got it worse than those in some of those in Chernobyl. Um, and the reason for this is because the Soviet Union actually flew cloud seeding missions after it happened to try to force the radiation out of the air, the radionuclides. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and attract it to the water and force it to the ground where it's much more manageable than it is to the air. And they were trying to get the levels down before it passed into Russian territory. They actually gave uh, a, a fighter pilot a medal not too long ago for his actions doing that. Oh, so, wow. and this, and this is the proof. Um, if anybody knows the science behind this is uh, the intensity of exposure is measured by the inverse square law. Okay. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows this law. They just don't know it by name. Okay. Everybody knows the further away you are from a source of radiation, the less exposure you're going to receive. And the less amount of time you're around it, the less amount of exposure you're, you're going to receive. Everybody understands that. That's the inverse square law. Okay. In the Bulletin of the Bureau of Standards book, Volume 3, um, it's pages 80, 81, to 80, 81 and 82, it, it explains that the inverse square law does not apply to extended sources of radiation. Okay, They try to go there, go uh, on, I think it's up to 104 or something like that. They try to explain how they use the inverse square law uh, Talbot's law and uh, Lambert's cosine law, mm -hmm. and they try to use some math and calculations to find the aggregate of source points. 
the aggregate of little pieces of radiation that gets spread across an area, right? right? It's no longer in a point. It's distributed into the field, okay? Mm-hmm. So that law does not, does not apply to extended sources. There's no way that they could find the aggregate of source points or source points on the surface of this planet. And, and Belarus proves that because the, they were further away from the site, yet they received m- more exposure. That tells you more right exposure. there that the inverse square law does not apply because we have a water cycle on the planet. And the biggest danger when it comes to contamination is the water solubility issue. I don't know if you know what water soluble Mm -hmm. is, is it mixes with water. It'll bond Mm -hmm. to the water molecules, right? Some of these radionuclides are water soluble right from the start. In the case of uranium, you have to use like a strong acid to make it water soluble, to make it to be able to bond and mix with the water. That's why I brought up redox conditions when Carl was on, that's oh, and that's the chat. becoming right. Right, that's that's becoming more acidic. It'll cause it to be more water soluble okay. and mix with the water and flow around the planet. So these radionuclides will bond to the oxygen in the water. They will evaporate with that oxygen, and they will condense back into liquid and fall back to the planet. Gotcha. That's the danger. Okay. And a lot of people don't understand that. It's not just the radiation part of it, your external exposure to gamma rays or any of that. It's this stuff moves around the planet. It's in our drinking water. It's in the rain. It's absolutely traveling around the planet. Hmm. So Yuri Bandischewski, right? He found all this, this, he did all these studies that actually went against what the World Health Organization was saying the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. Right. Um, And they actually trumped up some charges on him, and they put him in jail because he was trying to tell the truth about what Chernobyl actually did to the people in the area. And you have another man. He was was a uh, uh, Alexei Yablokov. He was uh, an ecologist, I think, in Russia. He was, he was right there in that same 2001 Kiev Symposium um, explaining the damage that was caused. Wow. And it, the and it, 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 interesting thing is, is that, look, the, the, the IAEA, the World Health Organization, uh, an organization called UNSCEAR, okay, they're all part of the UN. They're all part of the same organization. So in this um, in this symposium, uh, the ex director general, uh, Dr. Nakajima, he was the head of the world organization when Chernobyl occurred, and he is on camera admitting that the IAEA controls everything that the World Health Organization puts out about nuclear. They have final say on everything. The IAEA. The All International right. Atomic Energy Agency. All They're right. pro-nuclear. They want to spread spread it all over That's the planet. That's not the same right? guys that have us at uh, like 30, like a milliliter to midnight. No, no, that's, uh, I, I don't know who that is, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying. No, the clock, yeah, the doomsday clock or whatever. No. Okay. That's the atomic scientist. All right. That's the atomic scientist. I got right. a little bit sidetracked, sidetracked by somebody in the chat who is completely um, trying to gotcha, have a gotcha moment for you. <laughs> Fall for me? Is yeah, it Yeah, for you. It's Vento. Absolutely. Vento. Oh, no, no. Vento, who has never been here before, who I'm thinking. Maybe, Vento, are you... Um, are you Carl? <laughs> I don't know. It's, Might be. It's, it, I, I don't know. Vento's d- d- doing the gotcha. And, and that's fine. I mean, you know, he's 
accusing you of making it all a conspiracy and should you get x-rays like you're saying that if all all nuclear is bad painting a brush with it that's all and no uh, we haven't even we haven't even discussed why n normal daily operations are dangerous it's not just a meltdown that's dangerous oh no we but he was talking about can you get an x-ray at the doctor's <clears throat> office sure i'll take an x-ray well sure. that's the thing I'm, He's look just... i'm not i'm not scared of Vento radiation because i just... know of a, about it i don't have some sort of irrational fear of it that's okay all right so let's let's continue i'm just like uh you know I was that's a lot of, that's a lot of the issue is that the, that that people that are against it they fear it because of of some things you know, in a movie or, or this or that or the other, and they haven't really educated themselves on it. So they don't know how to debate it or, or have a conversation about it. That's where we're not all the same. Right. We're not. Oh. Simply. <laughs> All right, let's see. Where are we? No, of course, we're not all the same. We had the, um, okay, so we went up. We were, no, we were here. And uh, now we're yep. going to move on to the extent with children's screening. And okay. We'll talk about okay. that this a little is, bit. This is, this is about Fukushima. Uh-huh. Okay, the, um, this is from the IPPNW, the International Physicians uh, for the Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Okay. Um, the head is from Germany, I do believe, and I believe the, the head of the, this organization put out this, this study. Um, they were the oversight committee to the Fukushima Health um, Department uh, thyroid study in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, there was um, three different stages of the study, um, and uh, the initial... The initial stage, the first stage, um, many pro-nuclear people, uh, those that uh, want to promote the atom, the, the splitting of the atom, they tried to come up with this, this uh, well, the screening effect is along the lines that, well, you're looking for it more, so you found more. Okay, that's the screening effect. So you only found more because you were looking for it. OK, mm -hmm. which could have been the issue with the first stage of the study. But as the second and third stages were conducted, they mm -hmm. found that the children that they tested before that didn't have any lesions or any problems with their thyroid now have an issue. They have lesions. They have problems with their thyroid now. So it simply cannot be an, uh, an, a screening issue. It so as they grew up, be. they monitored children through throughout, and that's what we're finding now as these kids are 20 years later. You know, how many right. years later? Yeah. Well, they get up to the age of 25, and then they move on to the next study. Right, right, right. Okay. All right. That's... So so the whole this whole thing, they um, from the first screening, we probably move on to the next one, the next uh, slide there. Um through the different stages that they did, they, they kept on losing people mm -hmm. in the study. And a lot of it was from pressure from the Japanese government to have them get out of the study. Okay. There was a lot of manipulation. There was a lot of stuff going on over in Japan. They had the state secrets act. Um, so a lot of this information is manipulated. A lot of uh, things happen that don't show up on a piece of paper or a study or, so they lost people, but they still found much more issues than that, even what they predicted after the subsequent explosion. So on the right side is what they suspected after Fukushima exploded or at least what they said on paper and they calculated it. And this is the amount of people that should have had an issue. But we see on, on the, in the middle column uh -huh. that reality doesn't match what predictions and and what it does on paper this is what i was talking about that reality doesn't match up with what they said was going to happen so that's that's the important oh, part about this study i see right mm -hmm. what they suspected was going to happen versus what actually happened wow 
That's interesting. That's and this a, is out of there could less be a, than. Sorry. No, I said I could see a deep dive into these studies and statistics. I I haven't kept up with them, but they are right. probably pretty right. pretty fascinating. Mm, right. Mm, 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 mm. All right. So where are we going? Well, um, I could talk about Fukushima a, a little bit more. Um, let's 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 get down to the to the uh, what occurred. Okay. There was three separate hydrogen gas explosions in three separate units, okay? Unit one, the explosion occurred in the upper portion of the building where the crane is located, okay? The upper part of the structure is an open area, and it's basically just ribs with a sheet metal on the side of it. It's not really hardened or anything, okay? So that's, that's what blew up was the hydrogen gas meeting oxygen in the outside air and then it reacted and had an explosion which is shown in the video you had sent <clears throat> me to play right, if we right. were going to do an intermission right uh unit two uh it is said to have an explosion more at the base of the reactor vessel itself mm -hmm. and it caused damage um underneath unit two is the highest ever recorded uh, measurement of radioactivity ever on the on the face of the planet is unit two, unit two. in Fukushima, uh -uh. up underneath the reactor. That's where they've highest readings. It's mm, terrifying. So uh, then unit three, um, that's the big explosion you normally see everybody show. Um, that originated inside the reactor vessel itself. It was focused up, upward, and if you look at these designs of the Mark I reactor, uh, it's basically just a cannon turned up on end. All right. So that's why you see that, that shot up, because it was focused upwards. Um, it blew out the side of the building. Um, there's um, some people, like Dana Durnford, that say that the, the fuel poles blew up, that it, it spread all these... Uh, rods everywhere and that 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 just isn't true i have to make sure that is known the fuel pools still exist we have pictures of them we have pictures of the fuel inside of it so that is that has to be known if if anybody was questioning that i have pictures of that over on my channel if that's a question in your mind let me dispel that that worry there is not spent okay. fuel blowing up okay uh unit four it had an explosion uh but only it is said i don't know this for sure but it is said that the the exhaust pipe of unit three and unit four they shared so the gas the hydrogen gas that was coming from unit three traveled through that exhaust pipe over to unit four and that's why it had an explosion um, because they had all the fuel out of the, that reactor because they were refueling it. So okay. all the fuel was in the spent fuel pools. Yeah. So it's important to note that in Unit 3, it is not containing anything. All containment is lost. The reactor vessel is cracked. The building is cracked. And they, were, they are losing on estimates of 300 tons of radioactive water per day from this site they are pumping water into the reactors and they are sucking it out and putting it in those tanks that are back there if you've ever seen that site they got a, a thousand tanks on that site of contaminated water and each tank holds like 1.1 million liters of contaminated water okay. um that water they're actually running it through what's known as the alps treatment and it's, it's meant to remove these radionuclides. Um, I've actually made a spreadsheet that I have a video on that shows the contents based on TEPCO's numbers and what possibly can still be contained in those tanks. Um, I don't know if you've heard, they've tried to, um, they're trying to dump all this water yeah. into the oh, ocean. Oh, yeah, I, I right. have heard. Uh-huh. Right. I so, have read so, about this. So you'll hear, you'll hear that, Ugh. you know, 
it's it's all clean except for tritium. It's all clean except for tritium, right? There's the only thing in this water is tritium, which is not true. Even the TEPCO information tells you that all 65 plus of the radionuclides they are searching for to remove from that water, none of them are at zero. None. So there is well, some radioactivity from those radionuclides in that water. Okay. I do okay. have a question that I've seen in the chat, and it was about okay. the earthquake in that ha occurred at Fukushima, and did that okay. damage the core? People are saying it didn't. It's it's possible um, an, it, that it did not. It's, in an observable it's possible. It, 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 uh, there's earth there's earthquake ratings for these sites. And um, I don't know this for certain. I heard this through uh, Kevin Blanche, but I believe the, the spent fuel pools can really only handle a, a 7.4 or something around there, that lines. Um, I would be more worried about the, the spent fuel than I would be the reactor itself. Um, okay. This is, this is really thick metal. This is really thick concrete. Mm -hmm. This is really hardened stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it could have. I don't know. I, will, I, I haven't been there. I haven't been underneath the reactors. I, I can't tell you one way or the other. But we do know it's damaged from the explosion, and it is leaking water every day for the past 11 years. All right. And that's, years. remember me talking about the water solubility issue? Well, those, a lot of those radionuclides are water soluble. They're bonded to the water, and they will flow with that water wherever that water goes. We talked about acidic conditions. Well, even, what is it, glycerin. Glycerin will actually cause the acidity of an acid to increase in strength. The acidity of an acid to... Increase in strength. Increase in strength, the acidity. Yes, okay. glycerin. Gotcha. Right. I got you. So that so that's that's main mainly the issues. Um, I show that that in that water there is there is upwards of sixty seven billion becquerels left in that water. Now we, we really didn't talk too much about the the measurements becquerels. Um, that's one disintegration percent per second is a becquerel. A becquerel. I kind of mentioned the Curie, mm -hmm. which is based off the radium-226, and it has 37 billion disintegrations per second. That's what the Curie is based off of. Um, you'll hear the, the sievert. Yes. This, the sievert has to do with your actual effects on your body. That's what the sievert and the counts per minute are measuring. Okay, that's your radiation mm -hmm. versus... Becquerel is the radioactivity. Sieverts, counts per minute. That's your radiation. That's your okay. alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, there was on, on measurements here. Um, okay. Exposure. Uh, you, I, I'm sure you've heard of absorbed dose, right? Yes. Absorbed dose. Or yes. you got absorbed dose, which deals with basically your external exposure. Um uh, deals uh, the the unit is R rad. It's a rad R A D. Um, one hundred rads is equal to one joule per kilogram. Mm -hmm. There's that joule again. Okay, yeah, there it's it all is based it. on this That's energy. It. There are those joules so it's, again. So it's so it's the amount of energy that is put into a mass. That's one joule per kilogram, right? Then you have your dose rate if time is an issue, that's your dose rate. So if you're in it for a period of time, then that's your dose rate. Um, the issue comes with the difference between internal exposure and external exposure. And, and in, this two, in that 2001 Kiev Symposium, you hear the pro-nuclear people saying, well, there's no difference between internal exposure and external exposure, it's the same. We find out many decades later that that simply is not true because when we're talking about internal exposures of organs, you're talking about the equivalent dose or the effective dose for the whole body. Um, we know that alpha, alpha radiation is worse internally than beta or gamma 
because we have what's known as weighting factors or um, uh, like a quality factor. Okay, so what this means is that you have to convert rad to rim. Okay, and that's that'll be rim, which is rentagen equivalent man. I know it's a lot. It's crazy. There's there's so much to this, there's and it's difficult way to understand. Too much. But, but rentagen, rentagen equivalent man will be what your your actual dose is, what you're getting. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So it has to be converted from rad to rim. That's how absorbed dose works. You got your range, your deposition through the range, uh, area of irradiation, and the density of the means. Okay, and then you have to take rad and convert it to rim. So to make that conversion. Alpha, beta, gamma are different. They have these quality factors, okay? So alpha, right. to get the rim of one rad of alpha, you have to times that by 20. Oh, wait, I had the little radio to activity get, just to show right. everybody again the alpha, beta, right. gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma. So, the... so to get one rad of beta or gamma, it's a one-to-one -one right. conversion. Okay. So it's the same. So rad and rem of beta and gamma will be the same. But for alpha, it won't be the same. You have to take the rad and then times that by 20, then you'll get your rem. So we know that alpha is worse internally because, as I explained earlier, it only travels a millimeter in the air. So it deposits that energy in that space. Well, when it's internal, it's doing that right next to your cells. It's depositing that large amount of energy right next to it. That's where the damage comes from. So we know that alpha is worse internally than it is externally. Do you understand that point? Yes. Because the way it travels, the way it deposits its energy. Yes. Okay. So you have those that those those quality factors, those weighting factors that 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 proves that it is, is not the same externally as it is internally. Um, they say in the, it's called the linear hypothesis, okay? And this is, a, this is kind of widely used, but it's not accepted by everybody. And they say that 25 sieverts will cause one cancer. 25 sieverts, okay? But three sieverts over your whole body gives you a 50% chance of dying within a few weeks. Three sieverts versus 25. So 25 sieverts will cause cancer, but three sieverts over your whole body will ca cause you a 50% chance of dying within the next couple weeks. That's a bit overwhelming. So how could you ever, you know, how could you ever get cancer if you die? If you get 20, because it's, because it's cumulative. You're dead. <laughs> it's not all in one bang. It's right. over your entire life. Your exposure adds up. It's cumulative. You get one dose this time, it adds to this next dose the next time. And it keeps on adding and adding and adding. It's all cumulative. It adds up at the end of, end of your life. Okay. I see all the comedians in the... Uh the chat tonight they're all here of from course the, they gotta be. they're here no but they're here from the ego modernists it's okay yeah, that's okay <laughs> i gave that's okay. i gave carl his show and i am giving paul his show so everybody is just trying to be as respectful as we're they just can. getting started we, oh but the, we haven't got, even got to we haven't even got to the affluence yet they don't want me to talk about the affluence is that the measuring food the, the next one about measuring that's the dis that's the discharges that's the oh. normalized discharges right. the daily normalized discharges well i think we're going to keep going and i'm not going to do the intermission let's just keep going okay. because we're doing really well here and and okay. i will put the link to your uh <laughs> oh my god yes they want he want we're going to have a show with the two pauls don't worry <laughs> everybody's such a comedian <laughs> I guess though that's the thing, you know. No matter what, if you if you feel f too, or you want the um, we could still keep our sense of humor because we're sure. all here together. We're all on the one planet. Just, just, just remember those folks that Carl couldn't tell you the physics. Carl didn't tell you about the inverse square law. 
Carl didn't tell you about the affluence, the normalized discharges that we'll speak about later. Right. He didn't tell you these conversions. He didn't tell you the jewels. All he did was tell you the generalized information that we all know. Well, we'll get there. That's going to be when you guys are together. And I'm just going to step in the back. I'm going to let you guys have at it. <laughs> all right. So He's where not going to like it. <laughs> well, we're not. We're all going to be very considerate because that sure is, i i that is i i appreciate my, his 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 opinion about it we're it, considerate people here we're all allowed our opinions yeah all right so where are we moving to next did you uh hmm. want me to go to the vo the what was the vogue the executive vogley um plant uh, it's the vogel the vogel plant in georgia plant. that's a very interesting study yeah if you if you want Did to touch want on that to go there all right sure we have sure. a we have a document i hope you can see it i'm going to read it really quickly the executive summary the southern uh company is it southern yeah southern company yeah, has southern proposed company. adding two nuclear reactors to the uh two existing ones at the alvin vogel plant near waynesboro georgia such an action would be potentially harmful for local public health as a basis for predicting such harm and uh and changes in levels of environmental radioactivity and local cancer rates since vogel began operating they were analyzed the major findings were number one the two reactors release airborne radioac radioactivity on a routine basis. Releases are much greater from Vogley Unit 1. Am I saying it right? Vogel. Yeah, Vogel. Vogel. It's Vogel. Okay, it's Vogel. Yeah. Uh, from 1987 to 1990, as Vogel began operating, to 1991 to 2003 during full operation, a range radioactivity levels uh, average see i told you i couldn't read and i didn't bring my glasses in all right <laughs> let me just go all the way average radioactivity levels in drinking water river water and sediment down river or at the vogel plant rose beta in raw drinking water plus 37.1 percent beta in finished drinking water plus 17.8 percent beryllium which is seven, beryllium seven in sediment, yeah. which is 39.5%. Uh, cesium 137, which is in the sediment, which was up 37.4%. Uh, titanium in river water was up tritium. 44. Oh, yeah. sorry. See, tritium. Yes, yeah, tritium. All yeah. right. Well, I can make this bigger and then I'll just, nobody will see it. But, uh, <laughs> well, I could do it that way. Okay, so during the same periods, cancer, the cancer death rate for children and adolescents, wow, in the 11 counties closest, this is uh, pretty heavy, uh, closest yeah. to the uh, Vogel rose 58.5% compared to a 14.1% percent decline nationally during the same periods the death rate in burke's burke county georgia where vogel is located rose sharply for all cancers uh, especially for blacks and for children and young middle-aged adults while the u.s rates declined in the late 1980s burke county cancer mortality rates were below the u.s but now are considerably higher so change your mortality rate all cancers 1987 to 1990 1991 to 2003 category and we'll look at these different all ages all races and burke's plus 25.1 united states minus 4.2 percent all ages whites Burks, 17.5 up, United States minus 3.7. All ages blacks, plus 30.7% in Burks, minus 5.7% United States. Age 0 to 24, all races, plus 55.5% in Burke and minus 14.1% in the United States. Age 25 to 54, all races... 
plus 55.1 percent and then minus 2.9 in the United States. The findings suggest that some factor introduced between the late 1980s has raised cancer rate risk in the area, particularly in Burke County, because radioactive chemicals are known to cause cancer. The startup of Vogel 1 and 2 should be considered as one contributing factor based on the Above observations for 1991 to 2003, over 500 excess cancer deaths in Burke County can be projected over the entire 40-year license period for the two existing Vogel reactors. Adding two new reactors could potentially double the total. It would be prudent to examine the correlation between radioactivity from Vogel to local pop public health risk further before proceeding with any plan to add new nuclear reactors to the site. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. that's a large jump. That's a large increase. I mean, they have measurements from just after it began, and they have the measurements, uh, I think it was in 2007 was when they released this study. So they have basically a before and after of what this site is uh, releasing into the environment. And the numbers are there. They speak for themselves. And this is at a 50-mile radius from the site, 50 miles. And, and, the, and a, a nearly 60% increase in cancers, mortality, that's on a 14.1% 14, decrease nationally. That's There's something wrong there. We will have the links. And uh, I just, uh, here's a comment, because I really have to ask this. I have to ask this. Okay. Demand the same for coal and natural gas. They release more radiation than any nuclear plant. Well, we're not talking about coal. I know. That's somebody talking to me. I know. This is is, is the, 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 the type of thing that most people do. They, they jump to something that they do know to argue about something that they don't know. Okay, yeah. we're not well, they want we're talking about that. the issues of a nuclear reactor. Right. Okay? I know. We're talking about the damage. No, I'm I'm trying to explain to this person that that you can't talk about apples if you bring up oranges. It's a completely different thing. Okay. Thanks. Absolutely, they all agree. We got to get rid want, of coal. And, and we got to get rid of fossil fuels. We we've got to figure out a better plan. And but nuclear is not the way. It is not the answer. And that's it good. You've isn't. answered. You've answered a question from Gary because Gary uh, earlier, I think it was um, our follower Gary that had asked. Uh, yes, here it is. This is an amazing in-depth interview. It's obvious Paul is um, careful and well-prepared, but he also had another one. Um, Gary, where are you? Gary, Gary, Gary. Oh, here it is. Okay, Gary. I would love to hear Paul summarize what he would like us to take away from his presentation on nuclear power. It's great stuff, but some summary would be helpful. So we're getting towards there, Gary, but I thought I would put that up so that we could make sure we have that you know what is it that you want us all to know about this because we are getting to the hour and 15 so we've got to uh, move on that's why we don't have time to do the uh, intermission but we do have questions so right right um uh, i'm anti-nuclear obviously um what needs to happen is um transparency really uh all these things that i'm bringing up uh, you won't hear about the the media won't tell you the scientists won't tell you that these reactors release radionuclides into the environment. They are not emission free. They are they are advertised as being emission free or carbon free. They are neither. They emit H three tritium. They emit carbon fourteen, iodine one thirty one. They emit uh, beryllium-7, cesium-137, um, some of the reprocessing um, plants. They, they release even worse and even more uh, 
uh, Ruthenium, they release um, Krypton 85, Krypton 85 and Xenon, uh, what is it, Xenon 133, uh, these are greenhouse gases. So a nuclear reactor releases greenhouse gases. Okay, the carbon-14 will actually bond to oxygen, which makes it 14 CO2, which is radioactive carbon dioxide. Wow, that's... Uh, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the iodine, it causes thyroid issues. Uh, the, the beryllium-7 causes, was it, granulomas? It causes... Um, these aren't the, these sites. They they release things, and people need to be made aware of those things that they are releasing. Uh, the biggest one is tritium, and the people here that are they're pro nuclear will say, "Well, tritium is is harmless," and it's based off the MeV, the mega electron volts of the beta emission which is, what is it, zero point something. Yeah, I got it written down here. But that's what they base their, their, their understanding of it being harmless. Well, the issue with tritium, okay, and I think we have a slide for this. Uh, um, we do. Yep. Yes, tritium, okay. As it's released into the environment, it will be incorporated into to organic matter like plant life, okay. And what this tritium does is that it either replaces uh, hydrogen in the cell or it bonds directly to the carbon in the cell. And when it does that, it forms organically bound tritium. Okay, that's a different form of, tri of tritium and that stays bonded for much longer. So it has a longer biological half-life. Now, they say tritium exits the body between 12 to 30 days. Well, organically bound tritium has at least double the biological half-life. Uh, tritium is considered the softest radionuclide. It's, it's harmless, right? But um, uh, I think we have a – do we have a, one more slide on tritium? Or we, no? I, you know what? I don't think we do. Okay. If well, I had it, what I could tritium, find it. I will tell you what tritium does. Let me see if I it causes it causes DNA strand breaks, micronucleus formations, cell necrosis and apoptosis, hmm. uh, chromosal aberrations, and various other phenomena, thus negatively affecting human health. Now that is a direct quote from a study on tritium. That's what tritium does inside your body. Don't let anybody fool you into thinking that tritium is harmless based on the Beatty emission energy. I can't find say, the other one. They'll say it's, 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 it's less harmless than even potassium-40, which is in bananas, which, based on the energy, it is. But we, we don't have bananas flowing in a water cycle. We have radioactive hydrogen. That's what tritium is, is radioactive hydrogen, okay? We, that's in our drinking water. That's the beta decay in your drinking water that the Blue Ridge Environmental Health um, study we just, we just read on, on uh, Vogel, Georgia. That's what they're talking about is your beta decay in your drinking water, and that comes from the tritium that they're releasing. Okay. So beta tritium is not harmless. It, it simply isn't. Well, I don't believe anything. That's just any of it. Yeah, it has a half life of twelve point three three years. Is it a um? Is it is it a constantly generated um, so, uh, thing that's in it, our it, atmosphere? It well, tritium naturally occurring occurs. tritium does occur naturally, but it is only found in trace amounts in the upper atmosphere and very rare on the surface of this planet. Right. Very rare. But given so a the, nuclear power so plant. So the tritium that we find, it's from these reactors. Now, speaking of tritium, that's what's used for the fuel in many of the designs for fusion is tritium. 
tritium is used as the fuel, tritium and deuterium, okay? That, that comes from the sun. Tritium is released from the sun, absolutely, but it's very rare on our planet. That's why it costs $30,000 per gram. Mm -hmm. And some of these inertial confinements, they need upwards of 200 kilograms per year of this fuel. Then you have the, the tokamak. I'm sure you've heard of the tokamak. No, well, I it, haven't. <laughs> okay, well, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a magnetic confinement. It's a little oh. bit different from the okay. inertial confinement. But I got it. It relies, it relies on a, what's called a lithium blanket that's on the out, outer portion of the reactor. Well, All it's right. inside, but it's on, it's on the surface, okay? And what it does is it, it, um, it makes tritium, okay? During the reaction, this lithium produces tritium, and that's how they replenish the fuel inside the reactor is through mm -hmm. the lithium blanket. But if they lose the, more than 1% of the fuel, it can't re be, be, be replenished. It can't replenish itself if they lose more than 1% of that, that tritium. And then when it comes to the case of like uh, the helion design that uses uh, deuterium and uh, helium-3 as the fuel. Well, it doesn't use tritium, but it produces tritium from the reaction. So it has to be captured and attempted to be stored. What most people don't understand is tritium will actually permeate the metallic structure of stainless steel, which includes inside tritium will permeate steel because it's the smallest of all radionuclides. It's the smallest. Okay. It'll actually split go through the structure and reform on the other side. Hmm. So you have not only tritium leaking from the reactors, which they, they try to do things to try to mitigate that a lot better nowadays than they used to with these older reactors, they're not. But any type of newer design, they're, they're gonna have some sort of, uh, uh, they use some sort of element, I guess, it starts with an E, I can't remember, but right. it, it kind of brings it down. But also the issue is that regular water comes into the plant to cool it, it'll actually capture a neutron and turn into tritiated water. Tritiated water, okay. Tritiated water. That's right. a mouthful. That's a right. mouthful. Well, I think what we're going to do is move on to some questions that okay. people have. I have some cues. Uh, let's see, there was, let's go all the way. All right, Kamishwari Kate. Can eating dried seaweed help to ameliorate the effort, effects of radiation in the body? I, I don't know mm. if you can answer that. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, well, she asked, I, I couldn't. Kate, it's are a good you question. still here? What's, yeah. uh, what would be the mechanism? Does she know the mechanism? Has she heard of the mechanism that would, would cause that to occur? Because I No, but I'll ask her. I'll make sure. Yeah, I would like to know. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested. I'm okay. interested, sure. All right, let's see. I know certain things attract certain radionuclides, like tobacco. People assume that tar is the thing that gives you cancer. Mm -hmm. It's not. Polonium-210 is specifically absorbed by the tobacco plant. Polonium-210. And that's the radionuclide that, that you're inhaling and giving you cancer. All right. Lovely. Um... Along with the carcinogens, you know, all the chemicals <laughs> in it. Okay, here, question. Is nuclear energy zero carbon emissions? No, as we, okay, let's, let's, let's think about this. To mine uranium, what is used to, to mine things? To get this uranium out of the ground, what do we use? Oh, fossil fuels. But she's talking, fossil fuels. But she's talking about running the plant. Is running the plant zero carbon emissions, running it, not building it or anything else. We're talking about just running the plant because a lot no. of people think it is. No, carbon-14. That's carbon. All right. Carbon-14. Well, sh actually, we do have, there should be another, there should be another thing that we didn't show. It's the emissions. I actually have a blue circle around some of them. Oh, 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 okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. There we go. Is that These are it? your normal. Yep. These All are right. normalized discharges. This is what they call normalized discharges. They normalized discharging things from these reactors. 
the corporations and the regulators, they've come to an agreement because it can't be done without these emissions. So no, it is not carbon free. As you see carbon 14 up there in the list that is released. Right. So it's not so it's not carbon free. It's not emission free. And, and you notice it's in liquid form and gas form. And you see the on the bottom that, that's where the reprocessing plants, that's what they they release. Okay, so normalized discharge, and these are the di type of nuclear power station, normal discharges. All right, I'm trying to understand this one. They're a little, uh, you know, some of these things, of course, are uh, over my head. And if they're over my head, they're, uh, they're over everybody else's that is, are not scientists, but um, definitely. Right, right. Um, so, but an uh, important thing to note is that it's, they're not emission free. They're not carbon free. And, and 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 as I was trying to say, the, the whole fuel cycle, if you follow the whole fuel cycle, they got to dig it out, they got to ship it, they got to process it, turn it into fuel using chemicals and whatever have you, mm -hmm. fossil fuels along the lines. They got to truck it to the plant. And then they got to, the issue with these reactors is that they, by international law, they must be ran with two separate um, power sources with one coming from offsite. So primarily around globally, every nuclear reactor is powered by fossil fuels from offsite power. Right, of course. Primarily, okay. Mm -hmm. You get in France, you get in France in certain areas, the reactors will power other reactors because the other site is powering this reactor over here, and this reactor is powering that site over there. You know. So it does happen, but primarily globally, every reactor is powered. The cooling pumps, the whole nine yards is, is powered from offsite power. Just to have a nuclear reactor, you got to burn more right. carbon. Okay. Question. Mike Olinger, Paul, since the majority of exposed concrete, nuke rod, casks, crack, and degrade quickly, what do you think of encasing the outer concrete cask with a lining of stainless steel? Dry cask. What he's talking about is dry cask. Um, so spent fuel. Cask. Once once the fuel has been used, they'll put it in a cooling pool for between five to ten years to let it cool off, and then it'll be cool enough to where the ambient air will keep it cool enough. So they put it in this dry cask. Um, this has a, a, a a negative pressure uh, and it has a gas inside to kind of help it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's exactly right. The, the, the radionuclides inside will outlive any containment that we put it in. They have a longer half-life than concrete can last, than steel can last. And if we can't bury it in the ground, because eventually, especially to leave it, to bury it and forget about it, that's not a good thing because it'll leak into the aquifers. It'll get it. Eventually those casks will break down and that's an issue. And that, you know, one of the things I, I don't like, or I always worry about is that these big nuclear power plants and others, other plants are on water, important waterways. It's cooled and by water. I, I just, yes, they have to be cooled by, by these waters. So I just, it just upsets me it upsets me that way, right. you know. Right. Uh, all right. Let's think about see. think about like a, a large grid down type of situation from from an EMP or something like that that shuts down all the offsite power. Think about that. Think about a, a large area of nuclear reactors that are powered by fossil fuels offsite and they get shut down. Well, what's what's to keep the cooling pumps going? That's a big problem for me. For me, right. particularly. Maybe Even a not flood or, or any number of natural disasters can happen to shut down off-site power. Mm. They got backup generators, but who's <sighs> to say that, that who's, who's going to bring right. diesel? Right. You know? All righty. Let's see here. Uh, singing way. Um, what about all the new clean nuclear we hear about? I think she's talking about what the fusion Probably the newer designs, the generation fours and fives. Yeah. Um, 
type of, of fission reactors. Um, oh, fission. They are a they are a better design. Um, yeah, fission fission is is splitting the atom. Fusion is bringing it together. Yes. And making heavier yes. heavier. Okay, so um, the designs are better, um, but we're not building those plants. There's very yes. few new generation plants that are that are built. The last the last site in Vogel is the last site that we built new reactors here on on in this country, and it was projected at fifteen billion dollars. It ended up being thirty billion, which is a double. And they wouldn't have finished it without funds from the public. Mm -hmm. The company had to come and ask pe the the people of the state of Georgia for money to complete the project. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been done. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. <sighs> All right, they're too wow. expensive. What a show. We are an hour and a half and it has just flown by. Yeah, it has just quick. flown by. Uh, and I, I want to say there's, you know, nobody's a troll here. These are legitimate uh, questions and sure. legitimate people here on both sides of the aisle. And honest to God, you know, everybody was here for, for Carl that wanted to be. Uh, and so we're giving you your shot because you've been writing to me and I said yes so just know we've all it's been aside from some of the smart alecky stuff which is kind of funny actually there's been some comedians out there it's been a really nice I, I don't chat. mind a good joke the outhouse is no. hilarious I yeah, love yeah. it <laughs> that, that's funny right there or I'm and out I, here fishing that's right, awesome right? <laughs> I don't I mind a joke I have an outhouse I literally I don't mind one. a joke but when it comes to this stuff I I'll debate it with anybody. Yeah, Anyone. I, I, physicists, I, I, I know, engineers, I know. biologists. It doesn't matter. I can talk about this subject with anyone. Good, 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 good. Um, let's see. Let me see. Uh... Yeah, and I got a challenge for all those pro nuclear people. I want them to prove to me that the inverse square law does apply to an extended source of radiation. I would like them to prove to me the with the ISL, square. the Talbot's law, Lambert's cosine law, and the math, and prove to me that the aggregate of source points could be found. Oh, there's going to be a lot of notes for the next show when we have the dueling banjos. All right, let's see. Gazer, Gazer, can the... Can the Wigner effect weaken steel structures, etc.? Yes, the Wigner effect, absolutely. That's that's a lot of the problems with like the bends that occur, like in piping. You know, as it makes that bend, you have a lot more corrosion occurring. They actually use a, it's called a hydrazine, H H Y D R A Z I N E, hydrazine. Hydrazine. They even they even use that in in, in spacecraft. Um, it's it's a it's a it helps keep corrosion down. It's an additive that they put inside okay. to keep the corrosion down. But yes, the Wigner effect absolutely it breaks down. It's it's all the neutrons. Neutrons are breaking everything down. It's stripping the electron. That's what radiation does. Hmm. Not just to biological life, but everything. Oh, we've got environmentalists here. You've got a lot to say today. Uh, let me see if I can bring up one of, I think it's a she. Uh, she's got a lot of things here. Um, but I, I agree okay, with everybody. Here, Fossil fuels got to go. Fossil think, fuels uh, definitely well, got to go. Yes, they do, and they never will. But, uh, uh, don't get me going on the Doomer stuff. You think Ohio was bad? Whip is insane if there was Whip. an accident in oh shit where did it go if there was an accident in the sh shipments just like happened in ohio this requires radioactive waste traveling in trains and trucks across the u.s well they they package them pretty well um the 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 stuff i've seen on on trucks and stuff they they, they build them pretty well um as far as the whip that was an issue because the reason Can you it tell us it, what WIP is? WIP Please. is a, the waste isolation pilot plant. It's okay. called. Um, okay. This is where they they were going to store nuclear waste, and they were using a kitty litter, kitty litter around these barrels, 
Well, somebody used the wrong type of kitty litter and it caused a chemical reaction and they had an explosion. And that's what caused that explosion at the, at the whip, at the whip plant, simple kitty litter. I'm glad you're here, environmentalist. She Me too. Usually, that was a good she, question. Thank well, you. She that, usually, that was, she usually thanks like, for bringing that up. I was, yeah, I was she gets on that. my shit, but that's okay. <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> uh, what about the health of fish in the waterways the outside of these? Okay. These plants? Um, there well, studies? I mean, they're, they're, they must be taking up tri tritium. Absolutely. Um, it must be getting inside of them. We know cesium. Uh, the, the levels of cesium in the albacore tuna caught off the west coast um, of California, they found that it had three times as much cesium inside of it. Cesium-134 and cesium-137. Right, you can the... find that in the FOIL. You can find that in the FOIA documents. Oh, okay. That, All that right. They, they did a study from of the albacore tuna before and after Fukushima happened. So we know that it does accumulate in the fish. Now, when you took, we didn't really talk about the food. How you, how do you detect in food? How do you measure food? You don't use a Geiger no, counter. No, we didn't. We have. You don't right use here. a Geiger counter for food. We have. Yeah, we do have that's something. Measuring like dose and measuring food. Go ahead. There we go. Okay, so to measure food, they must take a sample, and this sample must be a spe usually a specific size. They must take that sample and they must. Uh, reduce it, which means they, they have to get rid of the water. They have to get rid of the other material that makes up that, that uh, the mass of the sample. So the, the way they will do that will, they turn it to ash. They'll either turn, uh, uh, hot ash it or they'll, they'll uh, cold ash it, or see. they'll take chemicals and separate it through chemicals. Um, uh, but if, if you're eating it, it hasn't been Blech. sampled because they ha basically have to destroy it to sample it. So if you're eating a piece of fish, it hasn't been sampled. What may be sampled is a, the one fish out of the group of fish that was brought in on the boat. They're not checking every fish. You, you cannot check not. because water is a moderator, okay? And, and the moderator will block the alpha. Since we said alpha can be blocked by a sheet of paper... That water, the skin, the, the, the muscle, everything will block the alpha from being measured. But you're still going to eat that. It's still internal. Mm -hmm. So you will never know if an alpha particle is within your fish using a simple Geiger counter. Right. Wow. Whew. All right. Uh, Billy Joe, why is the Chernobyl containment cracking and falling apart? Wigner effect. I mean, it's it's been 30, what, 30 some odd years, 40 years, nearly 40 years now. So it's, it's breaking down. That's why they put a structure that will last uh, upwards of 100 years over the top of it. I can't remember when they did that, but it wasn't wasn't too long ago, maybe 10 years ago or so. They put a, an extra cover over it because it was starting to break down. I mean, that's just yeah, that's time with age. That. That's. You know, that's simply it breaking down for one thing, but actually the radiation is causing things to break down even quicker. Hi, Giant Curve. All right. A show would not be the same without my Giant Curve. Paul, do you think there are still any significant residuals in some foods as per Fukushima's range? Yes, it's, it's a continuous release. It's continually releasing. I mean, the fact that... We were subjected to the initial plume that flowed around the globe. That that explosion was seen all across the globe with all the detectors. So we and, know that the plume. But still um, now, now. Well, I mean, it's being 300 tons of radioactive water per day with those 65 plus radionuclides in it. Ooh, boy. I would imagine it is a continuous thing that keeps on occurring. Well, you have... Concentration ratios, that's how they try to make sense of, of uh, basically dilute, dilution, okay? It's a ratio. They try to, to use different formulas for, for bone, for dirt, for water, 
has different formulas. I actually have them in a video of the formulas. And they try to use those formulas to justify dumping it. You can't dilute radiation. You can't dilute the activity of a radionuclide. If you're going to ingest it, you're going to ingest it. It's flowing around the planet. It's not just staying next to the site because of the water solubility. People don't understand the water solubility issue. Okay. Yes, heavy, the heavy, uh, the heavy metals, those will fall closest to the plant. The heavy elements, yes, sure. But if it's water soluble, it is going to mix with the water and bond to the oxygen and flow around the planet. That's why you can't dilute radioactivity out of water. Otherwise, we just dilute or, or uh, distill, distill the, the water, the radioactivity out of water. You can't. It flows with the water. <sighs> that's why I, that's why I believe personally that Fukushima is worse than Chernobyl. Chernobyl released more in the initial explosion. But when it's all said and done, Fukushima will release more through this water that's leaking into the into the environment. It has fuel fragments, it has microscopic pieces of the fuel that's flowing with the water. When typhoons come into this area, the water level inside the reactor increases mm. as the typhoons come in. As it de uh. as it goes out, it decreases. All right. Now, I don't know, Lone Wanderer, exactly where we were on this one. Is it true it's so radioactive we can't send in machines? I think he was back going back to... Um, probably Fukushima. Yeah, back it's to, probably Fukushima. Or, or sending out the, also sending out the waste. It could have been... Could have right. been. But he's he's probably talking about Fukushima because they've they've sent in robots and each one within hours has broken down, completely stopped because of the radiation. We can't even build robot robots to go in there and and last very long to actually do any work, real work of removing the fuel and actually decommissioning it. We don't have a plan and we shouldn't have these reactors if we don't have a proper plan to deal with a meltdown. Okay. Put the right. cart in front of the horse. <laughs> I am finding, trying to find any more questions that, um, would you be interested in certifying, uh, debating a certified radiation expert on the validity of, of any of your claims? Sure. Everything I show you is from the science itself. It's not like Paul Mobley is making this stuff up. No. I'm showing you the documentation. I'm showing you the affluence. I'm showing you the, the Georgia study of the cancer issues. I'm showing you this information of this, this stuff occurring. Right. It's not, I'm, I'm simply not just saying it. I'm showing it. Fun P. Was Fukushima, hi Fun P, by the way, was Fukushima part human error? Mm, only because they didn't build the, the seawall high enough. I suppose that could be part of human error. Um, otherwise, I mean, the, the, the operators pr were probably, you know, flying by the seat of their pants. You know, this, was this... the design of the power plant? I mean, was no, it's a any... Mark one reactor. The only thing about the design I would be worried about is the, the, where the spent fuel poles are located, which are right on top of the reactor. There's a service pool on one side, and then there's a, a, a spent fuel pool on the other side. And during normal operations, the water level will be the same all across there. It'll be the same from the spent fuel all the way across the reactor, all the way across to the service pool. So, right. I, would, I mean, there needs to be better designs, better containment vessels. Um, the way we've built them is just, it, it, we did it. <laughs> without much oversight, it, it needs to be better. And we're operating these old reactors. We're not building new ones, really. And they keep sure. on getting their licenses yeah. renewed past their, their designed uh, time frame. Karen doesn't think there's, we don't need to debate the conventional, conventional energy has already controlled the airwaves and steeped us with, with, their, with their slant. That's more important. Well, I don't know. Sigging way, darling. We're going to do it. No matter how 
negative we feel about it, we'll, we're, we're, we're going to do it. Uh, didn't the government have to raise the acceptable radiation limits in food after Fukushima? Yeah, they didn't. Uh, what they did raise um, was after an incident. After an incident. So that's, so that's the levels that they did raise. Not your just normal everyday standards, but your, the, the levels after an incident. They, they increased. Yep, absolutely. They All shut right. down RadNet when it when Fukushima occurred. RadNet is the the national uh, radiological uh, measuring system, and a lot of the the, the RadNet uh, syst- uh, uh, stations got shut down, so we couldn't see exactly what what was occurring as it came through. All right. Well, guys, it's been. Almost, it's been over an hour and 45 minutes, and that's a lot for me. But I, I want to say that I appreciate everybody. Paul, I want to thank you for this. It's something, You're very welcome. As I do these shows, you know, I always have to watch them over when I have guests to li- really listen to my guest again, even though I have been uh, working with your material for a while now. And uh, I, I also want to say there's no trolls. We, we are all having discussion. I want to thank the people in the chat that may not agree with Paul for yeah, being Yeah, thank you. Cons- I love but, to but spark I, conversation. Were, I yes, love it. And they were considerate and everyone was considerate. And that's a big thing to me on this channel, you know, and uh, I'm I'm a nice guy. I I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to share information. And this, this is factual information. This is not like conspiracy theory. I'm showing you the science and what it says. All the Wally Blue. Hi there. Hi there. All right. Well, everybody's saying thank you. Thank you, environmentalists. Thank you, Kay. You guys are so Paul, welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate I it. I will be back with you. Um, we will talk about the next step in this uh, debate. And uh, yeah. again, thank you, everyone, for coming. I am completely... I'm very happy with the way the show went and especially with everybody being respectful with their different, um, their different attitudes. Right. And that's a big thing for me, you know, cause I had a meltdown. <laughs> this I week. mean, we're all humans <laughs> after all. I mean, we, could, we should be yeah. able to have different opinions, but still yes. respect each other. I, well, I love yeah. everyone, you know, the same. I, yeah. I have no problems with anybody, even yeah. pro-nuclear people. Yeah. Well, I've had some, They just have to come to terms with the things I'm talking about that aren't talked about. Well, and maybe that's what's going to happen in our debate. All right. That would be great. All right, Paul. Thank you, guys. I I love all of you. You know that. You know that. Peace out. And Tuesday night, uh, I'm probably going to bring my buddy uh, Rollin Switch, Alan back. We're going to go through the bomb train. We're going to go through the reports. And, and so everybody can understand exactly what's happening with that. Instead okay. of having to look at all these different uh, social media channels, let us, um, let us see what he has to say. Cause he, he knows, he knows his shit. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Bye right, guys. Do 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 do.